did you guys know the first Tomb Raider movie had a sequel? It's not very good! So, I, I, I don't know where to even start with Cradle of Life. I, admittedly, I didn't actually visually myself watch it and so quite recently because I didn't want to. There were a few reasons for that. As I elaborated on in my initial Tomb Raider retrospective, I'd never seen Cradle of Life at that point because it came out about the same time as Angel of Darkness, which I hated. So, uh, I wasn't really in a mood to be disappointed again and wow, I am so glad I, I, I went with my instincts on that because good lord, you know, it's not the worst movie and as an action flick, it's okay, but it is flawed in all the wrong ways. And I know that sounds like a weird statement, but let me explain. See, the first Tomb Raider movie had flaws, but they were all kind of good flaws for a movie. Like, for other mediums, this wouldn't have worked, but for a video game movie, it did what it did, and it did it well. Cradle of Life, on the other hand, is flawed in other ways, like trying to make it more movie friendly uh, or shall we say critic friendly because apparently the critics think this is a much better film than the original Tomb Raider movie it is not it is no 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 not even close not even by a long shot and it's got Angelina Jolie back and she's she's great and it's got Gerard Butler in a leading role and all the original cast members that matter show up again Alex West is gone but it's okay everything's fine you know, it's 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 whatever because it's it's about Lara Croft doing what she does best, and I'm sure we can find something to enjoy about this film, right? Our story starts off off the coast of Greece in the Mediterranean Sea, where Lara finds the Luna Temple, a lost temple deep below the Mediterranean Sea that she has to dive down and explore. Wait, 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 wait. Isn't that the start to Tomb Raider Underworld? I mean, that was Nibelheim, the Norse underworld, but but this is the same... Did, did Crystal Dynamics lift this too? I mean, it's fine. It's actually one of the best parts of the movie, since it does involve Lara doing Tomb Raider things, getting stuff. On their way in, they meet a shark, and it just lets it swim by. Oh, it, it sets an interesting precedent about this movie. Lara goes down with a team, and this, this threw me off, because this just isn't Tomb Raider. Lara... Generally speaking, for the most part, always works alone. Yet she goes down with a couple of dudes, and it, it's just a little out of character, especially back then. This will continue as the story presses on, but we'll get to that in a bit. So, while they're looting this place, Laura finds a weird orb thingy, and she wants it, but they get attacked by some guys. We don't know who they are at this point. And her teammates get killed, and she proceeds to fight back, but she doesn't actually have her guns. Which is also alarmingly out of character. Laura always, even in places where she really doesn't need them, always at least brings her pistols. That's like code one for Laura's tomb raiding habits. She always has those things and suddenly she doesn't? Did she leave them on the- I don't know. I mean, I know they're underwater and she does, you know, manage to get a hold of a spear gun, so that's good, but at the same time, I just feel like, like, like an underworld she brought them. I mean, I'm pretty sure her pistols are designed to be waterproof, specifically because she tends to do stuff like this, but, but the movie never elaborates on that, and, and, and they, they, they manage to beat her and get away. So Laura continues to pursue, but she also cuts her arm on purpose. What are you... Wait, what, what is she doing? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Why would you ever do that? There's a shark in the area, and you're doing that specifically on purpose to bring the shark to you so you can punch it in the face. And then you're using the shark to get to the surface fast. Wait. Whoa. Whoa. That's... Every... Everything stopped. <laughs> this doesn't... No. Okay. Couple of problems with this. First of all, there was no guarantee the shark was even going to come to her at that point. She really should have been swimming towards the surface. I know she was deep, but she probably could have made it. I mean, it re she really wasn't that deep. Even if that wasn't an issue, and I can assure you it is. But the shark shows up, she punches it once, and then it proceeds to allow her to grab its fin, and then it swims towards the surface, 
Okay, A, punching it doesn't guarantee the shark isn't gonna immediately turn back around and bite you. Like, that tends to, you know, push them away. That is a technique that people tell you to use to get sharks to get away from you, and that, that's fine. But at that point, why would the shark swim towards the surface? Also, why would it not then be bothered by the extra weight of a grown adult female on its fin? I, I feel like the shark would be a little more annoyed by this. It actually would literally make more sense if there were a convenient dolphin that just showed up and then Lara used the dolphin to get to the surface. I mean, at least there, the dolphin's smart enough that it acknowledges that Lara needs help and there are actually known cases of dolphins helping people get to the surface. You know, it's not any more outrageous than what just happened, so why not? Or, how about this, follow me on this, how about we just have Lara use her swimming skills to simply swim to the surface? That would have been fine. We didn't need the shark thing, like, to establish that Lara's awesome. It doesn't make sense even for Lara Croft to attempt such a ridiculous, nonsense, asinine plan! And then she gets to the surface, and she's exhausted, the boat's destroyed, she's stuck in the middle of the Mediterranean, and she activates her beacon and kind of passes out. Naturally, she's waiting for a rescue helicopter, right? Or maybe even a rescue boat! What? What's happening now? What? Uh, are you? No! Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. Everything, a summer, you guys brought a submarine? Why would you ever do that? That can't, that can't have been faster. There's no way that was faster than, than a rescue chopper. That's impossible. Unless the submarine was in spitting distance in nautical terms. The fact is, the chopper still would have made more sense. They weren't that far offshore, or a boat, or something other than a gigantic, full-size military s nuclear submarine. Are you kidding me? Why is this movie trying so hard to do these ridiculous things? I I'm not even 15 minutes in, and all this has already happened. And I'm just confused. This is so unnecessary. I mean, that's a CG submarine, right? I, I think so. So you took the time to CGI a submarine specifically for this ridiculous scene, Yet, you know, a helicopter was going to be too hard, except you have a helicopter later in the movie. I'm just, you know, there's doing a Tomb Raider movie, which already suspends disbelief a little bit, I get that. And then there's just going out of your way to be obnoxious and just trying too hard. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a line that gets drawn whenever you're doing a ridiculous tale like this. I get that Lara Croft always has been, you know, larger than life and that's how she is, but there is a point where it's time to stop, and I feel like we already crossed the margin. Then we get introduced to the villain. His name is... <laughs> I'm sorry, I always, always forget his name. Okay, it's Jonathan Reese. He is a biological terrorist, former Nobel Prize winner apparently, who is instead of using his insane knowledge of the microscopic to help benefit the planet, he has decided to create weapons of war and biological terrorism for profit. And apparently Interpol and MI6 and everyone else involved just can't nail this guy down, even though he has a sophisticated laboratory in the middle of Hong Kong. I just feel like you guys aren't trying hard enough here, but that's not the point. Anyway, in order to introduce how <laughs> he is, he goes out of his way to kill one of his associates who has betrayed him. That was an accelerated form of Ebola, deadliest disease known to man. Highly contagious. Wait. Literally all of that was wrong. Okay, you used an accelerated form of Ebola. Okay, I can see that being pretty lethal, but Ebola is not the most lethal thing on the planet. The most lethal disease on the planet known to men at this point is, believe it or not, rabies. See, the thing about rabies is that it has a long incubation period, so that's why rabies vaccines are so important. Whenever you get bitten by a wild animal, that's why they almost always give you a vaccine, because once symptoms show, there's literally a 99% chance that you're gonna die. It's just that it takes a long time for the symptoms to show. Ebola, on the other hand, tends to activate fairly quickly. However, it's possible to survive the symptoms if you're in a hospital, for example. Like, they can treat you and rehydrate you so you don't die, which isn't generally the same situation as rabies. Also, he said Ebola is highly contagious. Okay, that's true only if you touch the bodily fluids that leak out of the victim. Ebola isn't an airborne virus, otherwise it would be way, way more dangerous and harder to deal with. You only get it by touching the blood, urine, 
fecal matter, or anything liquid that comes out of the body. Which does happen with Ebola because that's pretty much what it does. It causes you to just expel and bleed everywhere. But he clearly only bled and then died. So unless you're saying you developed a strain of Ebola that is in fact airborne, literally everything of what you just said is a lie. And I just feel like Mr. Eco-Terrorist, Biological Warfare Specialist, former Nobel Prize winner, Jonathan Reese here might be smart enough to know when he's spouting nothing but odious, odious falsehoods. Anyway, he has an evil plan to get an ancient disease, and he's the one who hired the guys to steal the thing from Laura in any event. Laura's furious that her artifact was stolen from her, so she takes it out on the butler, because he really deserves that today. She's visited by MI6, who are asking her for her help in dealing with, well, the problem. Quite why they're asking Laura Croft for help with this it tells me MI6 is just bad at their jobs. I mean, I'm sure Laura is good. It's just kind of a weird situation. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. In any event, Laura figures out exactly what they must be after. See, the ancient texts tell of a tale of a pharaoh whose army was destroyed by a single box. So the pharaoh's son sent a dude to take the box to the end of the world. And in their universe, that was India. Alexander the Great later found the box, and it destroyed almost all of his entire army. So he was like, yeah, we're not going to mess with that anymore. And he had someone else take it to the Cradle of Life. Title drop. Lara is convinced that the box in question must be Pandora's box from ancient Greek mythology. And it must contain something that is the most unstable virus thing, whatever, to ever exist. Her thought is that this is the anti-life that must have shown up when life first showed up. Never one without the other yin and yang to have life, there must also be anti-life. I don't know why that actually doesn't make any sense, no. I don't know why that would be... whatever. When all is said and done, basically they don't want Jonathan Reese, Mr. You know, Biological Warfare Specialist, to get a hold of it and sell it to the highest bidder. Which is what his plan is. And, and frankly, that's pretty underwhelming in terms of villainous plans. Like, dude, I get that this is your thing, but... The villain from the first movie was way more interesting. At least he wanted power, and he came off better. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Jonathan over here. Okay, I, I'm really not, but there's, there's more on that later. In order for Laura to complete her mission, however, she has to get in touch with the Shea Ling, who are the ones Jonathan Reese hired to steal the orb from her in the first place. They're kind of a... I want to say Yakuza-type deal, except they're Chinese. You know, they're, they're just an underground black market in antiquities kind of thing, but they're incredibly dangerous. She requires the help of a former acquaintance named Terry Sheridan. Now, Terry Sheridan and Laura have a history, a romantic one, and Terry will be assisting her throughout most of the rest of this movie. And already, I'm pretty annoyed. This just isn't Tomb Raider. Laura doesn't work with a partner on most situations. That's just not what she does. She's always flies solo. That's part of why she's so awesome, but suddenly Laura is the one who specifically says, no, I need Terry for this mission. Do you? Do you now? You can't figure this out on your own. Laura's supposed to be able to do that, but no, she needs Terry. And really, do you need Terry? I don't think you do. I think you need his information, but that's different from actually needing him. Somehow, I still don't know how, she talks MI6 into getting Terry released from his life sentence, with his record completely expunged, as well as like five million dollars. And how did she talk them into that? The dude walked out on her and his men and began stealing stuff for the Shea Ling to sell for profit. He only cares about money. That's why they didn't work out. That's their whole history. But this whole movie is trying to establish that maybe prison changed him, and there's still emotion between them, and it's all sweet and caring, and this is going to be a disaster. I'm just warning you now. She talks Terry into it, mostly because he's still interested in her, and they decide to use a dropship to get in the middle of China. Why they couldn't just go there. It's not like they're at war with the Chinese government. I don't get it. Maybe they're worried about someone tipping off the shaling. I mean, I get that point, but first of all, this doesn't exist. This is not a thing that I'm familiar with, and I know a lot about military technology, like way more than anyone reasonably should. And that is not a thing, as far as I know, unless it's top secret, maybe the filmmakers actually did, you know, invade Area 51 or something. But in any event, this is ridiculous. Also, Laura's plan is to crash it and eject from it. And mind you, ejection seats always cause some physical trauma because of the overwhelming G-forces from them, so they'd already be injured from 
that entry from the get-go. Also, she says, oh, there won't be enough of a ship left for them to find. Really, because I'm pretty sure it's still going to leave a debris patch, as well as fire, where it landed. Okay, they're going to know something hit there. I'm just saying. And where do they get that stealth craft? FMI6 has it? Because I feel like that's a United States thing. Did they, did they at request the, the United States government to give them stealth technology? Because that's not really something, especially at the time, that the United States was really keen on sharing with everybody because they don't want everybody to have it. Listen, I'm, I know I'm getting way ahead of myself here and focusing on something that really could be overlooked, but it bothers me. So this next scene's in a village where Laura conveniently knows this woman? Like, where did you fall? Did you, 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 you planned this? You already know her? And you left a bike here? I mean, Laura knows people all over the world, so I'll take that bit. But I guess they must have planned their trajectory to wind up near this village, or near enough that they could get to it, so they could get weapons and stuff. And then Laura's just cruising down the uh, Great Wall of China. Even though the Great Wall is actually nowhere near where they're supposed to be going. <clears throat> Also, I feel like um, the Great Wall is one of the most, uh, first of all, it's a huge tourist attraction, so there should be tourists near it if this is a public area. Second of all, it's not a public area. I'm pretty sure China doesn't allow people just to casually motorbike down the center of it. Um, the scene's cool, and okay, that's fine, but again, you're, you're going overboard here, and I just, I, I can't deal with, with, with all of this in my face at once. Her and Terry have a little spat because he's like, oh, dude. Eh, why don't you love me anymore? It's not like I was a horrible person or anything. And she's like, oh yeah, no, you were a horrible person. And then she says he must be lying to her and not actually taking her to where she wants to go. And the Shailene conveniently show up, proving that Terry was actually doing what she asked him to do. And they get captured and Laura gets in a fight with the leader of the Shailene. The fight scene, admittedly, was pretty cool. And because her and Terry were separated, suddenly we get to see Laura work on her own. And I will give the movie this. Despite her being teamed up with Terry, usually what happens, and by usually I mean literally every time they get into an advanced situation, Laura just goes off by herself. It's actually hilarious how many times that happens. So we do get to see Laura work. The downside is that we don't get to see Laura working at what she's supposed to do. Because remember that tomb from the beginning of the movie? The one that was under the ocean and everything? The Mediterranean? It was really cool and we liked that scene? Yeah, Laura never enters another tomb the entire rest of this movie. Unless you count the end, which I don't really consider a tomb necessarily. It doesn't even remotely look like one. It gets trippy and weird. But my point is that we don't really see Laura doing what you'd think Laura would do. I mean, this isn't a tomb. This is just, you know, the Shailings headquarters, which looks like a tomb. It ain't, but it looks like one. And he tells them, the orb's already gone, and the orb is already gone. They zip line down because it was, it was cool. I'll, I'll take it. How nobody can hit them is beyond me, but whatever, it's fine. There was plenty of times like that in the first movie, too. But they know where they're going, so they have to go to the point to get the orb thingy back. It's important. It's the map to where the Pandora's box is located, to the cradle of life, the whole thing. They need the orb. The orb. The orb. So this scene is also pretty awesome. It's this nice urban action beat. Although I do love how they just like float a helicopter down and this is like their trade-off. Like this is how they're gonna subtly, stealthily make the payment and get the object. You know, I feel like on the long list of trade-offs that are considered subtle. Um, anything that involves a helicopter doesn't appear. I'm just throwing it out there. Why doesn't Terry do anything to help Laura until near the end? He's, he's right there. I know Laura ran off on her own as she always does, but you could have at least tried. You have a scope on your rifle, and then he like jumps but doesn't have the rifle anymore, so he steals another gun? I, why didn't you bring the, I don't, that had a... What? Wait! Also, helicopter blades do not just cut through things like, well, blades. They're, they're more fragile than that. They're, they're designed to actually break off when they hit something, so they don't... I, okay, never mind. You know, this is a common movie trope. I'll give it that one. What I won't give it is that there were so many opportunities to solve this problem well before it got out of hand. Like, again, we're back to the scope rifle Terry had. Why not just... No, 
shoot the pilot of the helicopter immediately in front of you. Heck, Laura's a good enough shot. She could have done that. Anybody could have done that. I just feel like this didn't have to go the way it did. That's not bulletproof glass on it. He's reaching down outside of it. The door's open. Do something! 